you know, we, we are, we are all sort of the heroes of our own stories, but we tend to look at other people, especially if we're in conflict or having a difficult conversation with them. We tend to think of them as the villain in our story, but mm -hmm. the reality is they're just the hero in, in their own story. Right. And so even this idea uh, of, you know, the human nature of, of constant comparison and um, which again, I think is, it is human, it is human nature. And so not to beat ourselves up for doing that, but noticing like, Oh, you know, anytime I might feel frustrated by someone or some action, like I, I really do try to look at that. What is it about that that is bothering me? What are the parts um, that that's something that I do? Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the podcast. It's 2023 has gone by. And we say that every time at the end of the year, my God, I don't know where the year has gone by in the next year. It starts again, never ends. So it's one of those things, just accept that we say it and move on. Uh, it's a nice cycle. If you look at it on a broader scale, as opposed to just month by month, week by week, day by day, minute by minute, it's kind of like, yeah, resolutions lack off uh, committing to those resolutions. So I think it's great. I think it's just fantastic that we can keep doing it. Um, yeah. And 60, or 70 or 80 of those revolutions uh, where you have uh, six, just basically think about it. You're saying it about 60 to 70 times, maybe less that, oh, the year, I don't know where the year has gone by. So use it more often, you know, because we can't, we can't say it too often until we're like eight or nine because we don't really care for us every day, whether it's the beginning or the end of the year is fun. Um, and when, let's be honest, after we're 80, we're like, oh, another year has gone by. You don't really... Mm, say it with the same kind of, oh, you're not, the year has gone by. So actually, like maybe 30, 40 times in your lifetime, you're going to say another year has gone by. Uh, I can't believe the year has come to an end. Because, you know, um, there's a sense of celebration if you are religious or if you're just in the festivities, right? I remember like 2023, 2013, 14, like December was a wipeout. Like I can't remember fuck all from December because people, friends would visit. It would just be that time of the year. You're partying, you have every night going out and you're just recovering the day. So in that context, you know, I think it's fine where I am now because I, I, I can remember the most of the year, which is quite crazy. Uh, do you want to remember the rest of the year or the whole year? I don't know. But I think it's um, it's just one of those things. So say it more often. I can't believe that the year has gone by. Or I can't believe the day has gone by. Just use that because you only have for 30, 40 times in your lifetime you're going to use that. Um, you know, the thing I wanted to talk about today besides the end of the year is this this idea of they, right? Now, of course, they, them has become a pronoun, um, which would be weird, by the way, if you are um, in the British scheme of things, because you might know like the HMS, the His Majesty's ship or Her Majesty's ship, there's a way of saying, so you can include the pronoun there, which um, they might have to do with become TMS, Their Majesty's ship, if if we get a transgender person in the royal family. Anyhow, uh, I digress. But this idea of they, and even if you look at it in the context of the resolutions and uh, the way we live our lives, we kind of have this me versus them or me versus him or her or they. and it's not always one against a collective or you against the world or you against another, but it's coming from this place that I am, as a result, I am not them, or I am uh, separate from them, or it's me uh, who is in opposition or in competition or in uh, a sense of uh, parallel to them. And automatically that, that creates this, this idea that um, you are doing something which is not enough, they are doing something that is better or you if you are on a path of like say health fitness or uh working out or, or, or meditation or on a path of professional success you're, you're always able to kind of look down then saying you know that, that, because there'll always be people who are doing more than you and less than you there are always people who are more successful less successful more fit less fit and that automatically comes from this place of you as a separate and the group that is a, a, a against you or a you see as opposing you or a threat to you or in whatever way it's, it's it's hard to identify this way of thinking because we do for the longest time or we're told for the longest time in school it's your classmates right who comes first who comes second who is smarter who isn't smarter who you are better than who you need to aspire and be inspired by 
um, and who's faster, who's hotter, who's sexier, who's dumber, who's the fuckhead, right? Who's the bully, who's the weak one. And this is creates this thing of, um, I am not a part of this um, in my, in the way I am, but I have to do something to stand out. Uh, whether it's study harder, whether it's be more of a sports person. And that sort of sets you up for, I think, disappointment. It sets you up for resentment. It sets you up in different ways. It could be also a positive thing, I suppose. But I, I feel this idea of you have to do something to um, be identified um in the collective as opposed to just being yourself in whatever way creates this uh the, the, this this narrative as you go on in life which uh, comes from a place of scarcity right that you know because you don't have it means someone else has more or because someone ha else does have it, it it means you have less for yourself and we all have kind of operating from that way uh, many of us i wouldn't like to say all of us there are people who just feel that, that there's abundance in um, everything we look at, right? From love to happiness to uh, sorrow to sadness and wealth even in that way because it's, it's you know, everyone can't be a multi-billionaire like say Be Bezos or Musk, but at the same time, everyone can't be miserably poor without a meal to eat. So I suppose there is an expression of wealth which suits you uh, and me and suits all of us which we're able to express in, you know, the, over the course of our lifetimes. But as we look more of this, I need to stand out as opposed to uh, just kind of being, a, you know, being essentially who I am in this collective of life and human, humanity. The moment there's this need to stand out, you do things and that comes from a place sometimes of scarcity where you kind of look at either at a group that is doing more or less than you or you look at a person who's doing less or more than you and you kind of set yourself up for that route of, a comparison and the, this root of feeling that you are um, disconnected. And I feel that sets you up for a lot of, um, I think a lot of, I wouldn't say suffering in that context. There may be suffering, but also sets you up for a lot of this, this, this existential um, uncertainty and crisis and interesting things, make, making life more interesting. And then you get on these paths of, self-discovery and journey of understanding and self-realization and yeah but i think just from a young age if we just said yeah these are your friends and these are your classmates just whatever to accept them i know it's easier said than done but just take it yeah Fuck, maybe maybe someone is uh, got a better uh, liking of math someone does have a better appreciation of balls that they can toss around someone just does likes running more you might appreciate colors you might appreciate singing so I think just recognizing that everyone appreciates something um, uh, and is sort of drawn to something more than saying you need to be drawn to academics and science and maths and you need to be more physically active. I think that kind of message sets this entire these set of motions or uh, sets set these things, these, these events in motion, which then kind of just get amplified as you get older. And the next thing you know, you have all these doubts about yourself and this, this, this this need to prove yourself and it just creates a lot of um creates a lot of expectations and burden uh, that you you know you end up taking along and weighs you down and just makes you feel like oh my god life is so hard but i feel this by, by addressing it at a young age and just appreciating what we are drawn to and what we're not um and being okay with it just frees up a lot of space to just figure it out and enjoy uh, the experience that we are given to live life. And of course, it'll be a lot of shitty things that come our way, but I think one big burden that we don't have to keep trudging along life with will be taken away. Yeah, another year has gone by. And my guest on today's episode is Amy Sandler. Now, Amy's uh, story is quite fantastic from uh, where she started out with her decision to go to Harvard, Harvard Business School, um, and then taking a huge leap of faith and getting out of that space to now be the chief marketing officer, chief content officer of Radical Candor, where they help organizations and people use kindness, compassion, and 
um, concepts and things that are not traditionally looked at as valuable and concepts that are proven in business, right? Because in business, it's all about, um, you know, one, one upmanship and it's about, you know, the, the, the fit survival of the fittest. But uh, the, the approach here is to be more understanding and acknowledge the fact that, you know, we are all humans in this experience. And um, how do we get about it? By recognizing that everyone can uh, contribute, everyone can be appreciated, everyone can um, work together for the betterment of themselves and the organization. So uh, Amy and I have a fantastic chat. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And, is, is, you know, I, I was, you know, really, really um, intrigued by a lot of the things that Amy had to say about her journey and what she does at work and what they do. She also hosts the podcast for Radical Candor, and uh, you can give that a listen. So, um, yeah, let me not ramble on. I think you'll enjoy this conversation with Amy. It's towards the end of the year. So unwind, relax, and kick your feet Kick your feet out, kick your feet back, kick your feet up, do whatever you want with your feet. It's your feet, it's your life. Uh, but yeah, without further ado, here's my conversation with Amy Sandler. Uh, and, and I really appreciate you being a part of this podcast journey with me. Thank you and cheers. Hey, Amy, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. I'm really excited to meet you, Soapy. I've already enjoyed our brief connection and excited to see where this conversation takes us. Thank you. And I'm very excited to hear your story. And uh, before we, you know, embark on that, I just wanted to, um, you know, highlight the fact that people like you are such a remarkable example for people around us because we have this conditioning in us, which is um, many times driven by a sense of finding comfort in a predictable source of income. And I think that's essential, right, for people to have money because how much ever we say it's important to find passion and fulfillment, I think, in today's world. Without having money, you can't support yourself, your family, your dreams. And um, But what happens as a result is people are afraid to break away from the source of money. And that then is amplified in their way of thinking towards what they do and what they want to do and what they want to get out of the things they do in life. And um, that I, I find that a, an unfortunate byproduct of wanting the, the comfort and wanting the, the safety net that money brings. So when I, when I look at people like you who are willing to break away from that comfort and comfort not just from an income or from a revenue stream, but from a way of thinking and trying to approach new things as we get older, I think that is such a um, an amazing example that you set. So first of all, thank you for um, joining me today and willing to share your story. Sure, I'm happy to. I love the the question, and uh, if it's helpful for people just to know where I am currently, I'm currently working at at Radical Candor. It's an executive education firm. I've been the chief marketing officer and the chief content officer. I'm currently the lead coach and podcast host. Uh, if people like podcasts, you can check out our podcast. And just to go into the, the, the sort of thread that you are starting to talk about of choices that maybe go off the beaten path a little bit, um, I, I can pick up the story at Harvard Business School in the mid-1990s where I was very much on a path of uh, if something was the best, quote unquote, then I was going to do it, whether it was going to Harvard, or going to Harvard Business School. And at that time, I realized I was uh, attracted to women, which was not something that was um, on the path at that moment. It was certainly not something that was uh, in the mainstream. I also started exploring spirituality, yoga, meditation, and things that in the mid-1990s at Harvard Business School were also not <laughs> something that people found. And I would say that even though that was, those were very difficult, they really did force me to start having my midlife crisis um, in my twenties rather than, you know, now when it's, um, you know, just been decades later, so I'm very well seasoned in these sorts of questions. Um, so it really forced me to look at who am I, what matters, what does living a good life 
um, mean. And one of the things I will say, and we can go into more detail, is that I actually do have a very strong safety and comfort need. Um, my dad was an entrepreneur, so, and I'm the youngest of three daughters. We actually all went to business school. We were also very encouraged to, you know, have graduate degrees and and contribute to our communities and families. Um, but I didn't. I, I I intellectually would like to be an entrepreneur, but I do like the safety of a paycheck and those sorts of things. And so that's always been something that I've had to balance and to learn how to access and and actually take some some of those leaps. And so I'm happy to maybe describe how I got into some of those leaps if that's a, a direction you want to get into. Is that where you'd like to go? Yeah, I think that would be great because just to understand uh, your um, decisions that you've taken and where they took you and what, what the results were like. In, in, in a context of, you mentioned these words of uh, midlife crisis, right? Because we condition to believe that at a certain age, we face these questions or we are supposed to face these questions. Um, and it's a bad thing, right, to have a midlife crisis. Right. You know, I don't think so because, and the fact that you had it in your 20s, whether it was your your, sex, your I mean, I've been having the crisis, I think, since the teen teen years. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> very yeah, ahead and, of and the curve there. <laughs> it's, such a, it's, a, it's such a beautiful thing when you are forced to be uncomfortable with yourself and the things you do because that's seen as a bad thing, right? That's like, why are you, why aren't you, mm -hmm. um, you know, doing what you're supposed to do or being told to do, uh, being, being, doing what you're told to do? Because sometimes when you look at the things that you do have, right? Um, I often now look at, um, and hindsight, of course, is 2020, but, you know, when I look at my, my eye condition, which I was diagnosed with, and for years I was um, resentful of it, and for years, I was like, I need to be a better person and ignore mm -hmm. that side of me and try to make up my inadequacies, which society told me I was uh, cursed with. But if you if you actually flip that on its head and say, you know what, because I have this, I was mm -hmm. forced to make uh, certain choices and look at certain decisions, which I wouldn't have done otherwise. And that's actually a benefit because I actually have to work from other strengths I have. And, you know, these things are, um, each person faces their own set of questions and um, they have to take certain steps in that direction. And it doesn't have to be at 20 or 30, each person. And for me, it happened at eight and I didn't know it till I was 40, you know. I ignored to look at it till I, many, many years later. Yeah. But I think it's such a, it's such a, um, you know, life in itself, not, not to simplify it, but the, the journey that each of us go on without knowing it. And many of us try to control it by putting a five-year plan. I'm going to be here at this age, here at that age. It's so trivial because if you look back, the life that you actually lived is nowhere close to what you wanted to do. And I think, isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah, I I love that framing. And I think, I, I, I agree. I think our greatest choice and opportunity as people is to really um, create the story and the perspective that we want to to have we we have these different things that happen and and our real choice is the meaning that we assign to them and how much of that meaning that we assign is from what we learn from our families or from our schools or from our culture and all of that and so one of the things i've been doing I, i've been wanting to write a book for decades and i finally at the end of 2020 finished the first draft and now it's still sort of you know how do i get it out um, from my my head and, and and what is going to be most helpful. And I think one of the things that you're talking about there is how do we kind of rewrite, reframe the narrative so that they really reflect what matters most. And I think for me, a lot of the narrative growing up and being in these schools and these just incredible opportunities of, you know, having such wonderful classmates and, and privilege and all of that. Uh, but I would say that I, I, I had to deal with depression and, and, and issues around weight and sort of general, what I would call not enoughness. Um, even though on paper, I, all the reasons I should be confident, but it wasn't sort of intrinsically there. And so a lot of it has been, and, and, and originally it was, uh, 
you know, well, if I was John Sandler rather than Amy Sandler, which is what I wanted my name to be when I was five. Um, mm. But this that was not a, a thing that one did in the 1970s in suburban Boston, Massachusetts. Or Adam um, Sandler, one of the two. <laughs> yeah. Well, then I would have gone on a different path. In fact, it's funny. I when um, I first moved to Los Angeles in the uh, in the 1990s and bet this was back when there was such a thing as telephone books and listings. I don't know if you have those. And so I was listed as A. Sandler in the phone book, Los Angeles. And so I'd get a whole lot of uh, cr what we would call crank calls. And the demographics of the crank calls, there was one group of like 13-year-old boys who were big fans. And then there was a group of like sorority college girls who were also fans. And then there were people who uh, really despised him and had very, uh, and that was the point when I unlisted my, my, my number. Uh, but yeah. And, you know, I think it just forced me to really look at, um, exactly what you were saying, which is sort of where, what are those gifts in those part of parts of us that, uh, you know, either are different or make things harder, et cetera. And I, I I lay, I had I was asking myself the, those questions in my twenties, thirties, forties, et cetera, uh, that I don't think I would have been asking if I if I had been born in a, a different body. Um, and and so I really am grateful. Um, I mean, now I'm just tired because it's very tiring to be sort of ahead of the curve on a lot of things, and <laughs> you know, so uh, it just you lead. Oh, um, but I'm. It's really wonderful to see where the world is now in terms of looking at things around mm -hmm. healing and and wellness and uh, and and gender and and all of those ways that you know. On the one hand, it, the world feels so much more inclusive. Um, and even though we were talking about the ways in which people are s still other people, I, I tend to see there's actually so much more. Uh, I, I tend to focus on the world I, I want to live in and the, I want to see, which is is so much more around connection. So, You know, that's the thing in the 90s uh, when you were exploring your sexuality and it was a difficult time and you wanted to use the path of spiritual uh, discovery as one of those ways of internalizing your questions and um, many of us now and you know even in the early 90s 1990 when I got I was eight and got diagnosed with this I mean I wasn't old mm. enough to have and mature enough to have these questions and dialogues with myself but it was a very different society back then as you pointed out right for acceptance and even awareness about these things while of course in India there were people already who weren't in the mainstream, yoga hadn't gone to the West, and, and it, in some way it had mm -hmm. through, you know, spirituality through Osho or or yoga mm -hmm. through the, the various teachers who went out West. But now, you know, fast forward to 2023, and I mean fast in that way, literally from 2000 to 2023 yeah. has been very fast. <laughs> um, yoga seems to be something which is very mainstream, spirituality, and every sort of concept like authenticity, mindfulness, seems to be the, the you know on the menu at every coffee shop along with the latte and cappuccino. It's like, can I have mine? You know, can I have can I have a mocha without sugar? Because God forbid, sugar is the biggest evil. Yes. And um, and then literally sip on that, saying, you know, when I picked up my sustainable business about conscious living, and I wanted to be the authentic version of myself, talking to my partner about being two individuals in equal relationship. I'm like, are you just saying this off a script, or do you mean a single word of that? Because all these things in themselves is a lifetime of discovery and understanding. Right? Mm. You don't have, and I feel a lot of these cases, and this is something I've been trying to look at, right? Uh, and I brought this up in a couple of past episodes. A friend of mine who lost his wife two, three years back, very unexpectedly, it happened in a week. He's been dealing with mm. his own tragedy and he's uh, seeking answers in, in astrology, right? The science of astrology. And, you know, someone mm -hmm. I know was asking him, asking, why am I not able to find a partner? I, I want to just settle down. You know, I'm, I'm alone. I need a companion. And sorry if I'm digressing, but I just wanted to say this to you. No. It's, what he said is if you constantly keep asking the universe for what you want, you're denying it from giving you what you deserve. And that really stuck with me because we only want answers nowadays. Uh, but how about asking the questions? Because the answers are out there. But the only thing we can determine are the questions we ask to life, right? Yeah, I, I, what you're saying really touches me and, and the journey your, your friend is on and, and the value of actually having those friendships where you can explore those, those questions together. One of my favorite quotes, uh, and this was from 
a very long time ago on my path when I was first introduced to it is from Rainer Maria Rilke of, you know, letters to a young poet and this idea of, you know, live, live the questions now, you know, and, and so much of, I think this path is embodied in those words of, you know, in the moment we can't necessarily have the answers and so much of it is about living the questions and what I have been finding, especially as there's so much information available, so much knowledge available, especially now with AI, all you need to do is ask ChatGPT, what is the path of happiness? And you can get an answer. Um, but but the, the, the knowledge, the awareness is very different from the embodiment, from the alignment of mental, emotional, physical, spiritual. And, and especially for me, I doing a lot of work on, on, on energy and what, what does are the sort of invisible pieces of all of this. So that's really where I've been very curious is this difference between things that we might know cognitively, uh, have intellectual understanding of, and yet the blocks, uh, I, I think it might be room, you know, our task is to sort of look at all the blocks to love. And so, you know, we might be standing at the, at the, at the, coffee shop talking about our sustainable businesses. Um, and then we use a lot of paper towels, which I confess to doing. And then, you know, we probably are, then we're feeling rushed and we're looking at our phone and then we're probably not being so kind to the person behind the, the cash register, you know, so it's like, yeah. how are, what, how are we actually embodying and, and, and showing up in the ways that, you know, we know that we want to get to, um, but maybe we aren't actually living into that. Yeah, because the thing is, these words and these things have become concepts and labels which you can um, you can flaunt or you can you can hide behind in some way. Because when you say anxiety, depression, or these key catchphrases like "I'm living an authentic life," "I'm a, I'm, I'm in a sustainable practice," I'm, "I'm I'm living consciously," the thing is, these aren't ways to get out of things, right? Because you can't use anxiety, and some people do, to get out of work, to get out of social settings, to get out of um, facing themselves. But if you actually look at these uh, concepts, these labels, what, whatever you'd like to call them, uh, if you look, look at them to be a, as a way to get into you, isn't that mm -hmm. what is the most difficult, but a journey that can actually transform the way you look at yourself? Because from, from just as a personal example, I had anxiety for uh, quite a few years. And the way I looked at it first, I was like, man, are you serious? I've, I've, I've lived quite a few years with this eye condition I've done stand up now I'm out there and now you're going to throw anxiety as me at me um, three years later when I looked at anxiety I was like okay this is um, something that I need to address because there's something I'm doing which is not agreeing with my state of being so th that entire way of looking at it shifted and it just became a concept which you can use the internet as a re reinforcing um set of resources to say, oh, I'm anxious and I can't do this, as opposed to, hey, why am I anxious? Let me look at myself through it. It's it's yeah. a huge difference. And as you said, it's so easy to intellectualize it and we have the information to back it up. And if someone uh, says, how can you be anxious? You're like, you know what anxiety is? And you can quote every psychiatrist, psychologist for the past 50 years and, you know, every support group that's in your life saying, you know, I'm anxious and you have echo chambers where they just say, you know, you're the victim. Versus if you just sit with your anxiety and I'm not saying, you shouldn't get help because I think you should professionally from a therapist or whoever, if you have depression, yes, it is a medical condition, but it's between you and that condition as opposed to something that you sought um, celebration from society, you know? Yeah. I, I really appreciate what you're saying. And one of the things I have found is, is knowing myself very well um, that I need a little structure uh, as much as I sometimes resent structure, but I need to actually teach things in order to practice. So I need to teach mindfulness to force myself to hold myself accountable to practicing it. I need to teach mm -hmm. radical candor, this idea of being you know, kind and clear in the workplace uh, with our communication so that I actually practice it to sort of build the, the muscle of courage. And so much of what you're talking about is is a practice. And when it comes to things like dealing with whether for me depression or even just I've 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 had some autoimmune issues over the years and so there's kind of limited amounts of energy that I have in a day and so it's rather than saying oh my gosh why am I so tired and I only have like three good hours and you know that noticing that I have that thinking pattern 
And I might feel like you were, were saying with your, your vision issue, you know, how you respond, that is your choice, you know, is my choice that, oh, I wish that I was someone different and I just had boundless energy or do we shift to, you know, it does kind of suck. And this is, this is my way in. And if I'm looking at everything as an opportunity to grow and to learn, and ultimately, you know, for me, at least I feel like, and we can go, get into this idea of purpose, like my purpose around how can I, how can I actually use these moments when I'm not at my best um, to actually practice what does loving myself look like through the exhaustion or the not wanting to get out of bed or those moments when, you know, I'm not at Harvard Business School, you know, whatever I think, quote, I should be. So I really appreciate that framing of, of first of all, um, accepting where it is, choosing how we want to look at it. And then what can I learn from this? And mm. I think the best part of it is that it, it gives you such an inherent sense of self-trust because then you know that whatever comes your way, ultimately you are responsible for how you're you're leading your life. And that, that to me, that is really, if in each moment, like I'm, I'm gonna do my best. And part of my best is actually choosing how I wanna define what's happening for me. Yeah, because it, when it comes down to it, the only person who's gonna spend time throughout your life with you is you. So if you're not able to kind of look at and address the things that are going on in your body, which is your mind as well, it's your brain and what it's uh, telling you and what it's um, you know, showing you about yourself. Uh, but if you avoid that and just wait for external support or external um, validation, and I don't think these are bad things, but if you start and only live for those as opposed to saying, you know what, let me start from within, let me look at this person I am and what I'm doing, why I'm doing it, why I'm not doing it, who I'm with, who I choose to spend time with, what I'm um, applying and asking myself. And if you don't start from there, but only kind of go from one um, concept to another concept, because that's what externally people are um, identifying you as, I feel the shell is going to crack and you're going to get more and more um, hesitant to kind of look within that shell because it, it gets harder to look at. And this is not to mm -hmm. preach or patronize anyone. I just think it's a very difficult thing to look at um, yourself naked with all the strengths and all the weaknesses and all the decisions and the quote unquote regrets, because I don't think regrets um, are necessarily in your control, right? Because that means going back and undoing, but you can't. And you, I just think these are such important tools for yourself and for your journey on life. Because when you just mentioned radical candor, it's a way of kindness and loving yourself in the workplace. And I think when you look at the workplace now, and I'm not a professional working in a corporate and I did that for maybe a year or two, so I don't wanna, um, you know, kind of put everything into my own perception of those two years. But when you look at the labels used in a corporate setting, like, you know, competitiveness, performance, and, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, going climbing up the corporate ladder and the hierarchy. And th there's one first thing is that I think there's the sense that my situation, like I can sit here saying, you know, I'm visually impaired, I've got a genetic, uh, genetically mutated retina, which is causing me a form of blindness, which is progressively getting worse. And that is way worse than someone who's a, who's got an autoimmune disorder. Like I, it's so easy to scoff at someone. And when it's just mm -hmm. a label, we, we're encouraged to do that saying that my problem is bigger than yours, but in reality, no, because you finding energy to do what you want is as important to you as for me to try to find a way to use the other senses I have to kind of to, 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 to live a life that I want to live. So if you, externally start measuring everyone's problems, then it becomes a pecking order, right? But if we're able to look at our own situation with all its, the weighing scale, I think then it's, it's a, I think, I don't have a question, but I just feel that's a great place to start with. Yeah, I, well, I really appreciate it. I, I've been doing a lot of training recently where uh, I've been training um, kind of trainers in other companies so they can, they can roll out radical candor. In one of the sessions, someone shared something that, that really resonated with me, uh, which is that, you know, we, we are, 
we are all sort of the heroes of our own stories, but we tend to look at other people, especially if we're in conflict or having a difficult conversation with them. We tend to think of them as the villain in our story, but mm. the reality is they're just the hero in, in their own story, right? And so even this idea uh, of, you know, the human nature of, of constant comparison and um, which again, I think is, it is human, it is human nature. And so not to beat ourselves up for doing that, but noticing like, oh, you know, anytime I might feel frustrated by someone or some action, like I, I really do try to look at that. What is it about that that is bothering me? What are the parts um, that that's something that I do? You know, this idea of like, if you spot it, you got it as is, you know, sort of a self-help phrase. But I, I think there's some element of those things where they can become almost markers for us of of either things that we value uh, you know, it's like, oh, something is going against my value. That's why my values, that's why it's, it's bumping up for me, or it's actually something that I do. And it's sort of easier to notice it in someone, mm. in someone else. And just to, you know, in, in terms of what we do at Radical Candor, one of the things I really appreciate most is that, so it's this idea of, you know, can I build relationships at work with people where I'm caring about them? I'm, I'm, I'm seeing them as, you know, a real human being that I want to build a relationship with. And I'm also willing to challenge them directly. And one of the things that we do is look up, even in just one conversation, the ways in which we might make mistakes. So maybe we're challenging someone, but we're not caring. And we might, we call that uh, acting obnoxiously aggressive. You're sort of acting like a jerk. And mm -hmm. it can be very easy to think about putting people in boxes, like sort of these these uh, as a, almost a personality test, like, oh, this person's a jerk and this person's always so nice and they never, but these are behaviors and these are, are tendencies that we have. And so I find that model very empowering because it's very focused, not on sort of intrinsic personality, but really on specific behaviors that we can do. Oh, I need to be more kind with this person or, oh, I need to be more clear. And so it's the more, it's like any, it's good writing, good storytelling. You know, if you just go on stage and do stand up and say, there was this guy and he was really funny and he liked this girl, like nobody cares, but starting to get specific, um, that's how we tell stories. And that's actually how we can take our, the feedback that we might be giving and receiving um, both praise and criticism in a way when it's specific, it's sincere, it's kind, it's clear that that is really what we're talking about. Um, and I can go into more detail, but I will say that one of the biggest shifts and teaching radical candor, you know, all over the world to all different types of companies is that it's, it's based on a shift from the sort of top down command and control companies to collaboration, to this idea that, you know, telling people what to do doesn't work. And it's very interesting because, you know, depending on what culture you were raised in, depending on, you know, what generation you're coming from, like that is a, a shift. When I was in business school and just starting out, it was like their workplace was very hierarchical and it just, and this is very much based on, on you know, on humility and leadership, on vulnerability, on compassion. And, you know, so that's where I, I do feel quite optimistic that, these are ideas that 25 years ago um, wouldn't have been successful in the workplace. It doesn't mean there's not still a lot of, you know, uh, top-down um, behavior, but I think there's, especially when we look at younger generations and where they want to go, um, people want to be seen as full human beings. Yeah, because this, um, you know, India over the past 15 years has just really grown with um, entrepreneurs, with startups, with some mm -hmm. companies that have really, you know, gone global and have set um, benchmarks for it, foreign investment. And there are a lot of people who are noticing India now that's where I live in Bangalore has become a hub for venture capitalists. And a lot of mm -hmm. people are, uh, you know, flocking here for work. And this started in 2000s with the entire outsourcing boom and uh, jobs coming here, a lot of people from different parts of India coming here now, even from different parts of the world. Um, and you hear these stories, right, of people who started off with an idea, they were, you hear words like they were bootstrapped, or they were, they got seed funding, and then they just took off. And I'm not a business person, so I might butcher these terms or the understanding of these terms. But uh, as a person who likes to observe human beings, you see the story where they, you know, typically started out of college, they were dropouts, and you Heard, you hear these <laughs> themes in many, many examples. And then 
they get to a place where they valued at a billion dollars or they uh, you know got acquired for millions and then you talk to these you look at these people in the interviews there's a sense of a what whatever this person is and wh whichever you know corporate they're in or which whichever line of work whether it's tech or healthcare or whether it's you know hospitality or food um there's a sense of power which comes with with a business and um whether it's at a managerial level at a ceo level whether it's within a team whether it's within between teams how do you address that with kindness and humility because intrinsically there is a need for power whether it's uh gender related whether it's socially whether it's mm -hmm. um in this case professionally because that's something that has driven us for years and while it's the salaries and the packages you see you know and now you when i when i do some shows or did some shows with the corporates you know you have this pecking order which is uh, i don't know if it's yeah. unconscious but when you go there and you know if you go directly and you know you if i'm i i don't and there's something from day one i've been trying to do is i sit in the front um while the show is going on before i have to get on stage because when the talks are going because otherwise you're relegated to be a backstage just given a bottle of water if, if you're lucky and like no no you can't be seen until you have to get on stage i'm like no i'm 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 as much a part of this i'm not going to interrupt the program but i'm going to sit here and you know be a part of it so i can get the energy of the room but there's this thing that you know when i i go talk to whoever it is but i don't know if they're the ceo and i think in some way this is where the i condition comes in i can't tell who the most um senior figure is based on looks but i can you know for me energy is very important so yeah. i'll talk to the bartender at the room i'll also talk to the ceo in the same context in the same tone because for me human beings are human beings but not everyone does that because you know you, my god you know who you were talking to that guy was a ceo i'm like oh really okay cool but there is this power game floating around in that room of who you're seen yes. with and who you should be talking so how do you um sorry i went around the world to come back to, to, no, to no, ask no, you I, this question but I, I just wanted to create this 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 understanding in my own head of we say these things like being humble uh, vulnerable um, open up opening up to your colleagues and being kind but isn't that a sure shot way of um being pushed down and someone else using that as a leverage to climb up over you it's it's a really great question um and i i, I did actually do a session um before the pandemic in bangalore it was my first time going to to india so i i know some of that uh kind of entrepreneurial spirit you're referring to power is uh, a big part of why so kim scott wrote the book radical candor she had been at google and at twitter um we actually went to business school together although i didn't know her at the time mm -hmm. and the, the 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 focus of the book was was really for bosses for managers how managers can actually kind of lay their power down in many ways to counteract um and 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 lead great teams so the book itself is really focused on like a new management philosophy that you don't actually have to be a jerk and power hungry to succeed. In fact, it's it's the opposite. But what makes radical candor radical is that it's rare. It's rare that we're both compassionate and candid. And so one of the things that we'll do in our workshops is go through what we would call an order of operations. And I'll say the the model holds for everyone. I do a lot of work with individual contributors all the way up to CEOs. Uh, and one of the things that I think is really interesting when it comes to power and this idea of, of humble and humility is it really depends on uh, where you are sort of systemically when you look at that word. If you are you know, a CEO, probably a white man in your 50s or 60s, you probably have a lot of systemic as well as hierarchical power. It's really important for you to lay that power down. If you're an individual contributor, you know, person of color, woman, someone with a disability, et cetera, you're in your early 20s, you know, uh, sometimes being humble can actually sound like humiliating yourself. And that's mm -hmm. not what we're talking about. And so I think those are very interesting words and phrases. And so when it comes to this order of operations, what do I mean by lay your power down? Well, specifically when it comes to, to feedback, to giving and receiving feedback, 
we really want, especially managers, especially leaders, but anyone with some sort of power, whether it's hierarchical or even just in a system where certain groups might have more power than others, uh, that one of the best ways to actually lay your power down is actually by asking for feedback. And it seems counterintuitive. You think about, oh, feedback is really a boss giving direct reports criticism. Well, no, in fact, you want to be asking for feedback. So for example, if I was a CEO and you were going to be going on stage, I would want to ask you, you know, I'm going to be introducing you, uh, Sophie, like what's one way that I can set you up for success uh, right when you're going on stage, something like that. You know, how can I support how can I support you? Also, when it comes to um, diversity, equity, inclusion, how can you be an ally? How can you actually say the thing if you do have some power that would be hard for someone else? Now, what's really interesting with radical candor, this idea of being kind and clear, you know, what makes it radical is that it's so rare. Unfortunately, uh, people kind of misinterpreted the phrase radical candor uh, as as license or excuse to just say whatever the heck you want. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm just being radically candid. There's usually, um, you know, air quotes uh, there where you're just saying, you know, that was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. That's a terrible idea. You know, no, that is not the spirit of radical candor. That is the spirit of obnoxious aggression. And so when we actually came out with the second edition of the book, we reframed it. It's compassionate candor. Um, okay. What makes it what makes it radical is that it's rare. It's you know we tend to think at work we either have to be really really you know nice and kind and just focus on the human part and care, um, or we just have to be so direct. Uh, it's rare that we're doing both, and that's really what we're focused on. Is that no? In fact. The best relationships happen when we are when we are doing both. We're, we're we're telling the person the thing they need to know. You can build trust and psychological safety. And I'll just tell like a sort of quick example. Uh, we did a, a partnership with Second City. You might know Second City. They're an improv group in the U.S. and and Canada improvisation. And we were just about to go on stage and. Uh, one of the improvisers, a man came out of the restroom and his uh, zipper, his fly was down. Mm -hmm. And my first reaction was, well, so who's going to tell this guy that his fly is down? Like he can't go on stage looking like that. And I'm, you know, looking around, someone's going to, it's like, Amy, you are literally the only person between him and going on stage. And by the way, you're teaching radical candor. Uh, so you need to tell him. So I pulled him to the side. I told him he was an improviser. So of course he was funny about it. Mm -hmm. But the reason I share that as a story is I teach this to hold myself accountable to doing it. It's so easy to think, oh, they're smart. They'll figure out they're making this mistake or, oh, um, you know, uh, someone else is going to, is going to do it. You know, we sort of don't think about the actions and, and you probably have done something like this, but before we would go on stage with improv, we always say, and we do this before our podcast, we say to each other, got your back. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's what I mean by psychological safety and trust. I can trust that if I'm working on a team, if I'm messing up, someone is going to tell me they're going to do it in a way that's, that's kind and clear. Um, they're also going to tell me maybe even more important what I'm doing well, uh, praise, you know, specific, not BS praise, like, Amy, you're so smart, you know, but specific and sincere praise. Mm -hmm. So we know more to do the good stuff. And so, you know, that's just an example of, you know, telling someone privately, doing it immediately. Uh, and that builds trust, right? Because now yeah. you're on stage knowing that, gosh, if I was doing something embarrassing, I know that Amy's got my back. And I think, um, you know, the, I, I, you know, now I've kind of identified who my friends are in the sense people I can really say they've got my back. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the guys who will let me go on stage with my fly down just to have a laugh later. And I think that's yeah. beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and they've done it before. They, don't, so, <laughs> they, they have your back, but not your front. Yeah, exactly. They get me hammered <laughs> and they're like record videos. They're like, hey, you know, yeah. which is fine because I know when it comes to something which really matters, they're there. But yeah, there's and that's real. I mean, just I know you're kidding, but there's the core of it is care personally. What does it what does it really mean to you? And you know that you can depend on them for what really yeah. matters. And for years, I didn't have that. Right. And I'm not trying to make this about myself. And I think for years, pe people still don't have that. I, I'm lucky enough to have had the opportunity to pull back from 11 years of doing stand up and saying, hey, 
you are going out performing with, uh, yeah, it's solo, but you have these guys who perform with you sometimes and you sit and drink with them after and you think they've got your back because they just say the right things in that moment to keep you off balance, whether if you're doing badly, they bring you, bring you up. If you're doing well, they kind of just pull you down. Mm -hmm. In your head, you're so kind of caught up just saying, stand up, stand up, stand up. That's my identity. That's my thing. You forget to understand and you come home and get irritated with your wife because she brings you down to earth saying, hey, this is what's important. And you're like, no, that's important. And we all have our different versions of the same story, right? Each person. Yeah. You want to please the world and you think the people out there who come in and out are the ones who are really uh, the people who've got your back. But no, it's so hard to identify who actually has your back because it's easy to say the right words which, uh, which, which, which represent that they have your back, but they don't. And I think that's something which is so common in every field, right? Because people in stand-up don't have your back. And that, and I think this is something which um, a lot of people who are in group sports, like in from a young age or mm -hmm. from any age or in the army or the uh, mm -hmm. some form of mi the, the, the military, they have people who've got their back because they might, you know, take the piss. They might, they might you know, uh, have pranks in, in, in the barracks. Yeah. But when it comes to bullets flying at you, they've got your back. Or when it comes to a game or... And I think that's what people are missing now because in stand up, the moment you know you do well, uh, they probably stand up and applaud. Or when you get a promotion at work, this. But the moment you're not there, and then the cafe or in the green room without you, all the bitching starts, or some form of bringing you down, or spreading some kind of stuff about you. And I think that is so. We use this word right, toxic, uh, quite uh, common nowadays to use that word. But I think that is the energy which is toxic in every field and how do you yep. um you know break past that because yeah what you said before this compassionate uh candor and telling someone you know what let your guard down i've got your back i love it but how do you how do you, how do you practice it yeah i how do you make it i really reality? appreciate you bringing that in and bringing in sort of the team the team sports examples because it really you know when we're when we're teaching and training this in the workplace, a lot of it is, it is about building, building teams where there is trust, where there is safety so that, you know, the whole goal is, is that we can do more together. If, if there, if we could all do it on our own, then we wouldn't be in organizations. We would all just be, even an entrepreneur needs, you know, other people to support. And I think, especially now we are so interconnected. And yeah. so, you know, the framework of radical candor, one of the things that's very helpful is in a conversation, you know, radical candor, compassionate candor, we're caring and we're challenging. Very helpful to look at the mistakes that we make, either if we're not caring or we're not challenging. So one of them I already shared, you know, you're acting like a jerk. Um, one of them to go to the idea of, you know, probably the most toxic is what we would call manipulative insincerity. And if you're imagining like a two by two quadrant, this would be sort of in the bottom left. And this is when you're not caring. So kind of low care, low challenge. This is that meeting after the meeting, this is the, oh, Soapy, your show was so great, you know, and then saying to someone else, oh, you know, that was terrible, right? Yeah. You sort of one thing to their face, another thing in the workplace, talking about someone, not to someone. And, you know, what we will often find, it's really interesting, and I'll, I'll share before I get to that, the, the other sort of quadrant or mistake we make is ruinous empathy. Now, empathy is foundational to this, but it becomes ruinous when we actually don't say the thing. Right. So if uh, if I didn't want to tell this this guy right before he was going on stage that his fly was down because I didn't want to hurt his feelings, well, then it's how much worse is it because he just did a two hour show like that. And and so, you know, obviously the stakes get higher as, you know, in the workplace with other other things than that. But that's just a quick example. Yeah. And so what's really interesting for for ruinous empathy, for manipulative insincerity, thinking about. Um, we could almost call those like false harmony. Like you're not saying something because, you know, on the one hand, you don't want to hurt someone's feelings, right? So it's coming from a good place, um, but, you know, not so nice after all when you have to fire them six months later because you didn't tell them what they needed to do, right? So it's sort of, you're making a short-term, long-term trade-off. That manipulative insincerity, that most toxic one where we're sort of talking behind people's backs, now this could be very interesting because why why do we act this way? You know, I think in in TV and and drama we'll see that sort of backstabbing and politics. I think you know certainly that happens sometimes, but I think what's what happens more often is 
we're worried about ourselves. I mean, you were talking about, we're worried about our own financial future. We're worried about the promotion. Uh, maybe we are exhausted. It's like, gosh, I'm doing everything I can just to stay afloat. Yeah. The orientation of radical candor is I'm, I'm sharing this to be helpful. I'm sharing this because I want to help you grow. And, and sometimes it's sort of all we can do to, to stay afloat or maybe someone speaking of power, maybe somebody was bullying us and we are actually having to protect ourselves. Um, and so there's there's legitimate reasons why we land there. Um, but what's really interesting, uh, and then I'll sort of get your reflections, is that when I ask people, what mistake do you tend to make the most? And you know, we, we make all these mistakes all the time. I tend to make the mistake of ruinous empathy, empathy the most where you know, I don't say the thing, I don't wanna hurt the person's feelings. When I'm really stressed, um, I make the mistake of acting like a jerk. I usually go right to the challenge and, you know, and I don't, I don't like that either. Um, but why do we make the mis what, what happens when we say to people, what mistake do you experience most at work? Often people will say manipulative insincerity. Mm -hmm. And why do you think that I'm just curious from your own perspective, knowing human nature, why do you think we might say, Oh, I don't want to tell the thing because it, it hurts their feelings. But what I actually experience is, is um, somebody's actually not caring and not challenging. Why do you think it, it's different possibly? Mm, I think there's a, it's, it's a, I wouldn't say a double-edged sword, but I think by not being honest, um, two things happen, right? One is you kind of are passing on the buck. You're protecting mm -hmm. your own um, interests because you know, you can, um, you say, say you're bitching about someone, say, because they, they, you know, speak badly in the sense they just don't have good grammar, they don't have good pronunciations. And, and so you might all get together like the rest of the team and you might laugh at them, right? Behind mm -hmm. their back. Now, by going and saying, hey, in, in, in a sensitive way, right? I mean, you have the aggressive way, which is, hey, buddy, you sound like a jackass, right? <laughs> um, but the sensitive way would be taking someone to the corner and mm -hmm. saying, hey, man, you know, you really know your stuff technically, but when you make a presentation, no one takes you seriously because of the way you're communicating it. Here are some tips, and I don't have all the answers, but here are some things you can watch online because the resources now are so easy. And that would be a considerate way of doing it. Mm -hmm. But by doing so, you've laid yourself bare because that pers person can either be one of two, right? One is, or one of three maybe. One is that they take it sincerely and know that you're coming from a place of care and they want you, uh, you they know that you want them to improve. Or mm -hmm. it could be the guy going, this guy is, uh, they, they start doubting you going, this guy's doing it because he wants to bully me. He wants to put me down and uh, resent the person saying he's, oh, look at this guy. And this is where we are today, right? I'm the victim, I've come from a small town, look at this guy, he's privileged, automatically point the finger. Or the third thing, which this person could be scared of and not do it in the first place of telling this is, this guy goes to the boss and complains saying, this is what this guy did. And then it becomes a, that's why everyone CC carbon copies everyone emails, right? Because they <laughs> don't want to take ownership and they don't want the blame to come to them, but they want the success and the, set, the recognition to come. And I think that's why in some ways this happens, this um, manipulation. Mm -hmm. And now by not saying it, this is the second point you said, right? The manip manipulative insincerity, you can, and I've seen this happen in stand-up. They're like, wow, this guy, you're, you're so funny. My God, dude. And again, this guy um, will love it. But at the same time, um, what happens then is that you can use that to, um, while you're clapping, you step on them use their contacts, use their network, use their audience and get to the next level, you know? So I feel it happens for those two reasons and different. One is that you're scared that it's going to burn you um, mm -hmm. because three out of four times the person will use the victim card in today's day because that's what we're um, told to do because victims are celebrated. I don't know why in 2023. Um, the one opportunity where the person might say, brother, thank you. It's really made, made a difference is becoming rarer and rarer, even though that is what um, changes where you, you you get feedback from someone who cares. Uh, but the person is scared of getting burnt and getting thrown out of the team or getting accused of being a privileged person who's putting down his colleague or her colleague. And the second mm -hmm. reason is because you can use that as an opportunity to say the right things 
and slowly kind of um, creep up um, on this person's weakness. I think it's really well said. And often in workshops, we'll, we'll ask people, <clears throat> you know, what, what makes it hard for you to give criticism? What makes it hard for you to receive criticism? And some of it's around skills. Like, I don't feel like I have quite the right thing to say, or, or who am I to say it? Uh, if I don't feel like I'm in, you know, the right kind of headspace, um, I don't want to hurt their feelings if I don't trust or respect the person. And so a lot of what we focus on is building radically candid or compassionately candid one-on-one -on -one relationships. And that's why that order of operations I mentioned, I think is so important, which is actually starting by asking for feedback. You know, how can I build this relationship? If it's even something like the example you gave of someone who was, uh, you know, the way you sort of pulled them to the side and gave them some some guidance about uh, their um, how they were presenting. One of the things that we'll do is we will ask people um, I'll share a story about a time when I received radical candor and I'll explain, here's what care personally and challenge directly look like for me. It could look very different for different people. So do I know this person that I'm pulling to the side kind of well enough to, uh, to sort of uh, deliver my feedback in a way, I don't know how it's going to land for them, but I, I can say, you know, we like to do sort of context observation result next step. So the context is the, the presentation you just made. And I really like the way Soapy you said, like, look, you really know your stuff. Like you, you clearly have a command of the content. And, you know, I observed uh, when you were delivering your um, presentation about halfway through um, a lot of the leaders, they started looking at their phone. And, uh, and, and as a result, I'm my, you know, it, it seems like they weren't able to actually get your, your key point. Um, and so you sort of have context observation result, like what's the most important result? And do I know this person well enough like, so that it, they, we can't predict how they're going to hear it, right? Like, we know what yeah. our intention is. Like, hey, I'm doing this to be helpful. I had a similar thing happen. And, you know, this relationship is important. I really do want to set you up for success. And to your point, like, you know, I think one of the best ways to build trust is by listening, is by, by, by showing up for that person and saying, you know, t people will often say, how did this person show they cared? They took the time to do it. Um, they 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 described success as best they could in sort of my own concept of what success would look like. And so then the ne next step would be like, um, you know, I'm happy to practice with you before next time. Could be one example, or could be, hey, um, you might want to try moving your executive summary up to the top uh, so that people really get it at the beginning. Um, you know, what do you think? And having that conversation. But I think people, to your point. There's our intention, mm -hmm. but there's how it lands. And that's exactly what you're talking about. And so I might have thought I was being really kind and clear, but how did it land for the other person? And so one of the things we'll often do is have people think about like, who would you appreciate getting feedback from? And like, what specifically does that person do? What is it about that person, the way that they communicate with you, the way they, they, they share both praise and criticism, what is it that they have done to build trust with you? Yeah. Do you have a way of thinking about that for yourself? Um, are you asking me how I build that in my head? Yeah, I'm curious. Like if you were, and you might not have it on the top of your mind, but like for me, um, my boss, uh, Jason is our CEO. And so I, why do I really appreciate getting feedback from him? Well, he really knows me. He knows that I am very sensitive, that I am so critical of myself. So he, his job is actually to give me less criticism and to sort of, you know, make sure that I have like an accurate perception of what happened. Cause I'm going to focus on like, you know, the 99 things that went well, I'm focusing on that one thing that could have gone better. Mm -hmm. um, I learn a lot from him. He is present with me. So for me, something that I value is, uh, if I'm in a meeting with someone and they're sort of looking at their phone and they're like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, like I, I am check, like I, I, that is something that's going to feel like it's not caring. Um, and so he's very present with me. I learned from him and, and he, uh, he, he challenges my thinking. He thinks about things in a way that brings a different perspective. So like, those are some things that I really value. And so it can be very helpful to think about like, who are those people who are, who are the, when you talk about your go-to people, what is it that they do that sort of has built trust? 
you know i think that's um really difficult for people to identify because you know there are the telltale mm-hmm. things right people um leaning in and saying the right words like buddy you know you're so amazing you're so inspiring um but i think one thing which i don't have is a way to look at eye contact body language mm-hmm. and i think that's a great thing for me uh because i've developed i think which i didn't know but i think it's such an amazing thing that my body and uh when i say body that whole unit has developed yes. for me is the sense of energy through listening and i can in when i'm in person i can sense like for example um as i told you i've done close this is close to the 150th episode of the podcast now i i did it and you know obviously there are ways in which you fail where you don't get the listeners the numbers that you want you don't get the subscribers that you want and it's hard, it's it's hard to face the reality that one side you play the victim saying that you know my stuff is being pushed down by the algorithm which may not be the truth but you want to believe that because you're putting in episode after episode and you feel good about that and it's comfortable that you are putting in hard work in your own head but it's not giving results so there's someone to blame the machine the system the narrative is not suitable to the the popular sentiment right but in reality it could just be that the the product needs to be tweaked the podcast needs to be addressed and how do you hear that from someone who cares about it right um so you know that t- taking that as an example of work you know for me when i meet someone uh and they say oh wow your podcast is great man it's amazing i get an update every week now they're saying the right thing but i can sense that the energy is just that okay it, it's bar talk right oh you haven't seen me in 6 months and it's like man you're so amazing you're so inspiring you did stand up now you're doing a podcast when's the book coming out you feel good you feel a little tickle in your in your in your belly that oh you know these are the right words but is that the feedback by which i will evaluate my podcast and where i stand with the content or will it be someone who i get energy from which i it's mm-hmm. hard to describe the energy it's it's that the concern or it's the genuine interest in where it started mm-hmm. to where it's where it is right now and you can't get that with a text message or with a thing but when i listen to someone um i can sense okay are they attacking me are they doing it to feel good about themselves that because they couldn't do it they're putting me down and saying my product is rubbish or is it a friend who okay let's skip past the words but they genuinely have listened to episodes they genuinely i'm just using this as an example sorry the podcast yeah it's anything, a great right? example yep and i feel a lot of that comes from uh you know it could be patronizing energy it could be critical energy it could be condescending energy it could be insecurity that is manifested as as a uh, criticism or con- um you know this condescending sense like what is this podcast is rubbish man look at what that guy is doing right so it's it's hard but once you start looking past the words to what they actually feel when they're talking to you i can get it sometimes and it from a few people and those are the ones i trust it's so interesting and you know just that the part of you that's had to cultivate and develop those other those other senses you know we there's an acronym we like to use which is that radically candid feedback is is hip so it's 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 humble and that was what we were talking about before like by humble it's really about i am sharing my perspective like this is not the truth now there's a reason why i feel this way because of x y and z and i'm going to explain you know uh, i feel like this presentation is substandard because of x y and z you know what do you think but i i really am curious about what you think that's mm. really what we're talking about here which is that it's humble but from that place of real curiosity like hey sophie here's what i'm getting out of your podcast um you know how does that land for you what's your take on it it's helpful and i this one is really hard and i think this is so much about mindset and i feel like you've been talking about this a lot in different ways around is somebody you know are they now that they've become a successful startup founder you know is their goal to be helpful or is there sort of the ego there and now i want to keep my power and am i am, if i'm being helpful uh is now soapy going to get the slot for the one that i want and you know sort of all of these ways and i think that for people to be helpful and especially when there's finances or there's other things at stake um and this goes back to sort of where we were at the very beginning is like can i feel solid enough in my own self in my own integrity in my own kind of financial security let alone emotional stability so that i really can be of service and that has certainly been a journey for me where it's like is this helpful 
you know, someone might have said something and I might feel really pissed off and that's probably not the best place to to start a feedback session. So it's like, you really do have to look at like, where am I coming into this conversation from? And those are those, those are the things that you are picking, you are picking up on, you know, wanting to do it immediately. If we can't do it in person, you know, that we can do this in real time. Like you say, you know, please don't break up with people by text. And, you know, you, you might not be able to pick up on the nonverbals through the the vision, but there's other ways that you're yeah. picking up on those, those nonverbals, right? And like we talked about, you know, criticizing in private, but I think most important, what we talked about is like to take our feedback out of personality. Yeah. And it's, it's very interesting because part of what you're also talking about is not just like, we would call feedback praise and criticism, and we want to be giving more praise than criticism, but like really specific and sincere praise. So not like, oh, that's just so amazing. You're a genius, you know, but what is it specifically? It's like, oh, I was listening to this episode and you really went in detail. And usually people want to go to like these top five, you know, takeaways, but I felt like you were valuing me as a listener, as someone who really actually wanted a thoughtful conversation, you know, when you ask that follow-up question, right? So by being specific, we also show and sincere, we show what we value. And so, yeah. so I think praise can be different than like appreciation or gratitude, which is like uh, that appreciation for sort of your intrinsic humanity. Like you have this intrinsic desire to understand the human spirit. And like, that's something that resonates with me. Yeah. You know, because it's, I've been on both sides, right? I did. And I think a lot of people um, don't know this, but or they might know it, but they kind of, uh, might not want to face it, but we a lot of times live, uh, and maybe the, the, through from school, through college, to work, we live for manipulative insincerity, as you called it, right? Because it's nice to hear superficial things, right? Like, um, because it, it's comfortable. You don't have to um, make an effort with that person, right? Like, you can say, oh, my God, I heard about your business. Congratulations. Or, um, or I heard... You, you you have this startup or I heard you, you did a um, Iron Man or, you know, but you don't want to go more into detail because, hey, come on, you know, because uh, that means you actually have to spend time with the person. So I, li I lived a lot for that, right? Like, my God, you're so funny because it automatically mm -hmm. gives you status in the room. Like the funny guys walked in, right? But that yeah. can easily be flipped because that can be used against you, right? Because like, oh my God, dude, did you hear this guy is, did Netflix? He's funny. I mean, it, they don't say he's funny about that. Did you hear this guy who started off with you has now got this special? And immediately in your head, that manipulative insincerity, which was, my God, Sandeep, you're funny, becomes, oh my God, you're not as funny as him. And that can tire you. It drains you, right? Because then you're constantly at the mercy or at the, you're subject to their manipulation, which no longer gives you control over the way you feel and mm -hmm. when you actually want to, um, when, when I sit on this side and I talk to one-on-one -on -one and I don't necessarily, in, I, I mean, I do get it once in a while. People are like, why aren't you doing stand-up anymore, man? You were really funny. Um, to people like, wow, you're doing a podcast. I, I receive it. I, I, I acknowledge it and I appreciate it. But it doesn't make me feel like the, the biggest man in the room or the most, um, you know, it doesn't you know, massage my ego as much as it used to. So as a result, the flip side of it, when they say the same things like, oh my God, you heard, you heard about this guy selling our Madison Square Garden, it doesn't affect me because I feel happy for that person uh, because I no longer, mm -hmm. um, you know, view my self-worth with the identity of and the label of stand-up comedian because I'm on this side now because I know what I do is different from who I am and uh, the, the people who actually have got, who have got my back don't have it because of my my career choices, but it's because of a much more deeper connection. And I'll take their feedback, the three people or even the one person, um, more to heart than the thousands who say they like my work or they don't like my work or they like someone else's work. Because when you live in that life, someone else's success is your failure. And that's tiring. It's a, a zero sum game. And yeah, I really appreciate that. You know, you've talked a few times and I, I wanted to just kind of name it, this idea of identity. And I think, how do we define ourselves? And for me, I think that that has really been in terms of, you know, we, now this idea of like self-love and what, what does that really mean? But I think, you know, 
where are you getting your your sense of of self from and 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 for me certainly there was so much of it of you know external achievements and then even when i was I have become very aware that I was I was then getting a sense of self from like, oh, I'm the one doing sort of the different things. I'm living sort of this different life of, oh, I'm the, you know, the Harvard MBA turned meditation teacher. It's like, oh, well, now that's not very different. And so <laughs> like, yeah. you know, sort of, and, and the last few years for me have been very much this sense around identity of like, what is it like to let go of being special? And, and actually the liberation that can come from that and just, you know, to where we were talking about earlier, which is that sort of leaning into all of it and being like, what's, what makes me most special is actually all of those parts of myself, the parts that are, you know, uh, have maybe a hard time with energy or the part that, you know, likes to make people laugh. And I think there's just, that's, that to me is where I'm at right now around identity, which is a not looking externally and b kind of letting go of that that need to be um, special in whatever way, either the best or the worst, or you know, just like hey, here I am, just doing my best like everyone else, and we're kind of all on this this journey. And I think in terms of the spiritual process, it's been very much about being able to hold both, like there's this part of me that's going through the day and meeting this person and having this experience and this thing worked well and this thing didn't get, work as well. But there's always that sort of broader um, sort of spaciousness that I can yeah. fall in. I don't always remember to do it, but when I, when I tap into that, that is, that really is, is who I really am. And that's the, that's the way that I want to come from into the world. Um, and, and that's, sort of beyond words and it can sound very like new agey woo woo, but it's really about from that place of, of largeness, yeah. openness, et cetera, then I can actually put myself so easily in your, in your shoes and in someone else's shoes. And really like, we're all sort of special and not special in that way. Like we're all yeah. really interconnected. I yeah, need to I, figure out a better way to articulate that without it just sounding vague and amorphous. And no, like I got now what you just, said because yeah. words is something I love, right? I, I I love talking. I love listening. I mean, listening is my 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 one of my senses into the the world around me. Um, yet there's something beyond that which you just spoke about, right? It's the words is one which we can then translate to the labels, as you said, Harvard Business graduate, meditation teacher, now an executive, a part of an executive teaching program so great it sounds good but again it brings it back to the paper the resume the cvs it becomes to the comparison right but when i started to appreciate the the energy behind the words now again i use energy people could say as as you said it is a woo woo stuff but there is a humanness to that energy it could be um it could be malicious it could be like i'm, I'm going to make this i'm going to bring this guy down all right i i and you can sense it in so many ways if you trust your smell if you trust your your, your, your thing, you know, you get that butterflies in the stomach kind of effect, but it, it, you can apply that to different sides if you let your body listen and not just your eyes or your ears or your nose. And, I, and again, this might sound fantastical, but I'm trying to start recognizing that within me because the words, the projection of image, the way they look, what they wear could be, of course, and they're great, right? I mean, you automatically are conditioned to look at those things, but if I can hone this sense or senses or this entirety of senses, there is such a larger, um, deeper connection or lack of when 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 you when you interact with human beings, and if, if in some way you can sense that, I, I get what you mean, and take away these things because when you say, okay, when I look at eighteen to thirty-eight, those years, I, I was debauchery, right? I went to university, I don't remember what I studied. I went across two continents. I don't remember a lot of the curriculum. In fact, I sometimes wake up going, oh my God, I still have to go for the lecture on, on international yeah. relations, which was in 2002, which I skipped because I was hammered out of my mind. But, you know, can I be cruel to myself saying you, you messed up? Yes, I did mess up. But now if I look at those 20 years as the degrees I got or the jobs I held, it seems trivial. But the things I learned about myself, the, 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 the things that those years allowed me to do it's you can't put a number on it you can't put a price tag on it you can't put a a definitive set of labels on it but it's something i would never replace right and 
Likewise, what you've learned is so much more vast than the ways we're used and told to view our self-worth. And I think this is something which is truly important for people to measure, especially in a day where, in a time where every second you're expected to become a better version of yourself, which is impossible because the only way you do it is through getting likes and views and more subscribers and more credibility online. And when that's constantly shifting under your feet, if you're not able to say, hey, you know what? Every second, everything I do is contributing to the largest thing, which is my own understanding of myself. If you're not able to do that, then it's terrifying because the goalposts, if you want to call it, keep moving. Yeah, so well said. You know, as you were sharing, I was reflecting on, you know, especially when you are really good with words and, and sort of concepts, that space, you know, certainly I will access it in meditation or in Qigong or other practices, but it really is that that kind of stillness, right? When we're waking up, before we start like the stories and 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 the worries and all of that comes in and you know that that when you talked about having a little little one um you know that sense like pre precognitive and mm -hmm. and i think it's especially hard when we we are so good with words and with framing and concepts to sort of um let go of some of that probably the the last thing i'll say is is really around for me i'm i'm really trying to be more comfortable with with boredom, mm. you know, it's so easy now to pick up the phone, to distract. And I think it's so important to, in those moments of, of wanting to get out of that moment through looking at the phone or through comparison or all, you know, we all have our go-tos. Um, but that is really, to me, that's the gift is how are you showing up with yourself when you kind of want to be anywhere, but with yourself. That's amazing that you mentioned that just a couple of episodes back, I uh, had Josh Meisner, who's a teacher, and he also works in communication. And he said the exact same thing, that oh. boredom is something he's really trying to be comfortable with. In fact, he told his students, just take an hour off on a Saturday as an assignment where you do nothing. You can go for a walk. You can be by yourself in your room, but no engagement with uh, tools and devices. And he said the things that came out of that assignment with the students uh, I, I forget what that one um, statement one of the students made. He said it was mind-blowing because it basically was saying something to the effect of why are we um, spending so much time trying to understand the world when we don't understand ourselves? And that's what boredom teaches. So well, so, yeah. This comes I... from a kid who's in like high school, which clearly goes to show that we undermine the emotional awareness and intelligence because the kids who we raised, um, who were non-verbal, non-communicative, but in a, in, in a very incognitive, most very intelligent beings, because they're so pure to the world. And then we put all these constructs on them. We give them these tools. We give, put them in an education system, which is outdated. And then we go tell them that you're inadequate. And you know what? You've got attention deficit. You've got attention disorder. <laughs> it's the most cruelest thing that you can do to a pure being like that but yet we do it and yet we give them more tools yet we give them more reward system based in these tools and we give them games distract them tell them that distraction is the way and then we go and say you know what there's a problem with this generation <laughs> I hear, well i i'll share a story if it's helpful then probably we'll need to wrap but um i uh, this was probably six years ago or so. I was teaching mindfulness to CEOs. I was traveling all over the country and I was aware uh, that I was putting them out of their comfort zones by by teaching them mindfulness. And so I wanted to also do something that was out of my comfort zone. And so I did a, a four-day uh, silent wilderness retreat and, you know, getting the tent and we were really in the middle of, of uh, nowhere in New Mexico. And mm -hmm. the night before the, the retreat, I saw some friends for dinner and they said, oh, what are you going to do about the bears? And I was like, oh gosh, I didn't know about bears. So now I'm worried <laughs> about bears. And the first night I was very proud of myself. I got my tent set up. And then all of a sudden this, this storm came in and the thunder and lightning was so loud. It was almost simultaneous. And it sounded like a tree was falling like right near me. And anyway, I made it through the night. I couldn't believe it. It was really scary, but I made it through the night. But was even worse than 
that seemingly existential threat of the lightning storm was my thoughts. And we weren't allowed to bring anything to read. Um, mm. This was really, we, we were there just, and certainly not a phone. And I was doing a workshop and I, this was at a time when you'd be like printing out handouts for people to read for the sessions. And I had to go make handouts. And so I had this repetitive narrative, like, you got to get the handouts, you got to get the handouts. And I'm in the middle of nowhere. There's no way that like me thinking I have to get the handouts is going to get the handouts. But it was like that incessant mantra. And, um, you know, it was Saturday morning, I wasn't going to be picked up until Monday afternoon. And I share it just because, you know, when you are not going to those habits, you start to notice the mental habits. And I think one of the hardest things is realizing, wow, when we're quiet, all of the ways in which we have created these sort of habitual patterns of ourselves to get out of the moment. Um, so anyhow, I think I, I wish I had learned how to be bored more when I was younger, but I'm, I've been doing a lot of unlearning the past couple of decades. And I think unlearning is probably the greatest skill set <laughs> we all need. That's beautifully said. And I think that's where the mantras and all came from, from thousands of years back, right? When you're in, as an, as, as, hum, as a human being in, 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 in the wilderness without the comfort of, um, you know, say safety and also a, a system of distractions, then when there is the, 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 the wildness and the overwhelming nature sometimes of, 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 of nature you're confronted with, what do you do for inner peace to calm the mind? And that's the repetitive nature of some of the mantras and some of the sayings and some of, in, in, in every, um, whether you want to call it religious or spiritual teaching, there is this sense to calm mm -hmm. the mind. And now we um, are going back to that, which I think is beautiful. So. No, it's amazing. This, this, that I think that is something which has helped me as well. Unlearning and um, what you're doing is is amazing work, um, Amy. Thank you so much for taking the time to stay up. And it's almost it is night for you. And thanks for being with me here today on the podcast. I appreciate it. Oh, it's been really a pleasure, and I feel like we could go on and go in so many different directions. So maybe we'll we'll continue. But in the meantime, thank you for your for your presence. And Thank thoughtfulness. You. I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, I look forward to having you back on the podcast because um, I'm sure in the next few months the world will be um, here, I hope, but it'll be in a very different place. So maybe we can reconnect and share our thoughts on where we are then. I would love that. I'd love to continue the conversation. Thank you so much. Look forward to that. Thank you. Be well. Hey, thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you like what you heard, please do check out the other episodes on YouTube or wherever you get your podcast. And I would much appreciate it if you could like the video, share it with people who you think might enjoy it. And of course, do subscribe to the channel because it will help me and the podcast grow and reach more people just like you. So thanks again. Appreciate it.